All right. So it looks like we're live. Okay. Looks like we're live. Test, test. Hello, lovely people. I'll give a few seconds of airtime for likes to assure that you guys as the audience are here. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. I'm glad you found your way on over here to the Victorian Periodical Parade. Welcome to the reading of this month's edition of the Cornhill Magazine. My name is Owen, my partner. We're calling ourselves a storytelling team. We're reading from the May 1862 edition of Cornhill Magazine, um, just because it's May right now. And I will be assisting Dr. Kari Nixon uh, by reading the fiction portions. Yeah, it was edited at this time by Thackeray um, and was pretty wildly popular. Since we are starting these readings off in May, some of you, dear listeners, will be terrified to hear that we'll be starting off in chapter 35 of The Adventures of Philip on his way through the world. <laughs> now, we'll see how far we get in 15 minutes. I hope you enjoy. Ho be ho. Let's go. Oh, so next we have the first nonfiction article in June is about the Great Exhibition. And that is a fun thing to teach about. I'll sit here until at least some person votes. As a doctor will punch your chest, your liver, your heart, listen at your lungs, squeeze your pulse and whatnot. So this wily woman studied, shampooed, occultilated Tregabon. Of course, he allowed himself to be operated upon. Of course, he had no idea that the lady was flattering, wheedling, humbugging him, but thought that he was a very well-informed, eloquent man. This is called the High Victorian Era, 1850. 1850 to 18070. I call that the high Victorian era. And the way I teach my students about this time period is that there's really no period that better demonstrates Victorian arrogance. They just really, really deeply believed that white British men were the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan for earth and humanity. Ah, how wonderful ways and means are. When I think how this very line, this very word which I am writing, represents money, I am lost in a respectful astonishment. A man takes his own case, as he says his own prayers, on behalf of himself and his family. I am paid, we will say, for the sake of illustration, at the rate of six pence per line, with the words, ah, how wonderful, to the words, per line, I can buy a loaf, a piece of butter, a jug of milk, a modicum of tea, actually, enough to make breakfast for the whole family and the servants of the house and the charwoman. Their servant can shake up the tea leaves with a fresh supply of water, sop the crusts and get a meal. Tan bien que mal. Wife, children, guests, servants, charwoman. We are all actually making a meal of Philip Fearman's bones, as it were. In 1851, when the Great Exhibition is happening, and even in 1862, when they're writing about it in the Cornhill Magazine, they're at the height of this fantasy about how amazing they are, lest I be wrong. At the Great Exhibition, the beautiful great garden of women here. I'm sensing some misogyny coming up. She is an idyll all complete. Here we go. Instead... <laughs> So when I say that the Victorians had hubris, they had hubris. He is the most conceited man in London, Trail was going on, and one of the most worldly. He will throw over a colonel to dine with a general. He wouldn't throw over you two baronets. He is a great deal too shrewd a fellow for that. He wouldn't give you up, perhaps, to dine with a lord, but any ordinary baronet he would. And why not us as well as the rest? Asked Tregevon, who seemed amused. Buckle up, sit around, look and listen. Story time. It's about the only thing Thomas Hardy's ever said that makes me really mad. Oh, right. Mr. Fairman, you and I are kinsmen. I am Sir John Ringwood. I am myself nothing but a pastoral poem while I look on them. I don't, I don't really know what that means. A pastoral poem is a poem about shepherds. I don't know if he's like seeing himself shepherding this flock of ladies. Either way, it's real creepy and I don't like it. And I'm not here for it today. As for mere sonnets and such like brief things, they are to be picked up everywhere. Now as you behold that locket tossing on a fair unknown bosom, he's literally <laughs> looking at a lady's chest where she's walking and her necklace is jiggling on her bosom. And he's like, that's a sonnet. What a creeper. I'm gonna call him Joe. I don't like him. A boat on a summer lake. People, listen, come here, listen, gather around. Boat on a, 
Joe, no. Like, really, you should be looking at the exhibition. Or is it? And so we have still a more important exhibition. I think he's going to say women and women's bodies. Awful as well as beautiful people. I'm so angry right now. If the, I'm going to teach this article in every future class. Purity. I told you guys. I told you they're obsessed with the perceived purity. Yeah, Paul, isn't this amazing? I just, this is like such a great find. Y'all, was I lying though? Was I lying though? It sounds like I'm making exaggerations about how they thought pure women made a nation, but I'm telling you, it's like, this is just your basic magazine and this is the stuff they wrote about all the time. In former days, Trail had eaten and drunken freely at the rogues table, but we must have truth, you know, before all things, and if your brothers have committed a sin, common justice requires that you should stone him. So I think I'll stop it there. To me, that's actually much more interesting than just a play-by-play -play of what the exhibition looks like. So that's been 15 minutes of reading of Cornhill Magazine. Any questions that I can answer? This was really really bonkers and uh, just proves that I'm not exaggerating when I say these things. It's <laughs> so gloriously terrible. Okay, until Monday. Go on over to Twitter and follow us at Victorian Parade. Okay, bye.